So how many of you um, know that I was about a class away from being a theater minor in college? No. No. A, a couple of you, that's what I thought. My wife didn't know that until I told her last night. She might have raised her hand now, but that's kind of cheating. Um, so yeah, all throughout middle school and high school, I took theater classes. I loved performing. I loved improv. Um, I loved learning about like the history of acting, and I loved drama. And that's why I work with students, <laughs> because I love drama. And before you parents and grandparents laugh too much, that's why I'm a pastor, because I love the drama. And here's the deal. A lot of us actually like drama. When we hear a juicy story, we often find ourselves leaning into it a little bit. So one of the most exciting phrases that someone can hear is, I'm going to tell you something, but you can't tell anyone. Right? Like that's what makes our ears perk up. We hope that this is happening as we go through this series, that your ears would perk up as we open up the Word of God. We hope that as we look at Bible, uh, the Bible in six acts, that you'll lean into the drama of Scripture. But we're hoping to go beyond that. We're, go we're hoping to go beyond just being audience members. We want to actually find ourselves in God's story. But as we open up the Word of God and we consider it, we need to do so with great humility. For instance, in Act 1 three weeks ago, we talked about how we are made in God's image. And some of you went home and uh, you went and told your mom or your spouse or your little brother that you are made in God's image and therefore you are perfect. But then you forgot to apply that same theology and logic to your mom, to your spouse, and to your little brother, who were also made in God's image. In fact, the very people who wish to harm and destroy us are image bearers. So that means murderers, molesters, and maniacs are all made in God's image as well. And when we consider that, that should humble us. Let me give you, uh, actually, let me talk about Act 2 a little bit first. Act 2, we talked about our rebellion. We are all sinners who have willfully turned our backs on God, thus separating ourselves from Him. And here's the deal. It's not humble enough to just acknowledge that we've messed up. Scripture teaches that we're actually dead in our transgressions, and there's no amount of good works that could ever bring us back into a right relationship with our Heavenly Father. So as I was writing this, my wife, Lalia, uh, sent me a text that demonstrates this for us. Um, our son, Silas, who is three and a half years old, um, he bit her this week and made her cry. And now, I know there's some kids out there that are biters. Mine is not a biter, and so this is not like him. So I'm wondering, uh, why did he bite you? So Silas has found out that he has this power and freedom right now, and that is over a woman named Alexa who lives in our kitchen, the smart speaker. And so he often runs over to where Alexa is and he, he demands to Alexa. He doesn't speak to her kindly. He's like, Alexa, play Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. That's what he wants. He wants that song. You guys know, you know that song, Teenage Mutant. So he wants that song. But Lalia and Judah want to listen to something else. And in a fit of toddler rage, he bit his mom because he wasn't getting what he wanted. And he was like, oh, no, after he bit her. And he just apologized over and over. I'm sorry, Mommy. I'm sorry, Mommy. I'm sorry, Mommy. You know, patted her sweetly and kissed her. And I'm like, that a boy. Like, that's the right response. Way to go, Silas. But then there was another text. Right after he had felt like he had given his sufficient quota of I'm sorry's, what did he do? He ran over to Alexa and said, play Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. That's us. We mess up, and we're extremely sorry. And we ask for forgiveness. But so often, we go right back on to doing the same thing that we just asked for forgiveness from. That's the, that's the level of our depravity, that we are, we are damned, really, in the eyes of God. We are unworthy to be in relationship with a completely righteous and holy God. But then in last week's sermon on Act 3, we saw that God began this plan for redemption. 
He made his intention known that he would choose for himself a people, and through that people, he would establish his kingdom on earth. He promised that they would be his people and he would be their God and that he would raise up a Messiah who would save them. And for centuries, God's people waited for the fulfillment of that promise. And that's where we find ourselves this morning. We're in Act 4, which is arguably the most dramatic part of the biblical story. There is absolutely nothing more climactic than Jesus bursting onto the scene. And if we're going to read the account of Jesus without considering the entire Bible, then we're not going to be able to understand the fullness of what Christ has done for us. You see, everything has been building up to this point, and the significance of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection is all the more powerful when we consider it in light of Scripture and how it all ties together. So this morning, I hope to provide some answers to the following big questions. Why did we have to come? Why did Jesus have to come? Why did Jesus have to die? And what did Jesus' death and resurrection accomplish? Let us first begin in John's gospel. In a moment, we're going to open up to John chapter 3, but let me remind you of something that Pastor Tim preached a couple weeks ago. John has informed his readers that Jesus is not just some prophet or teacher. He's opened up his gospel by saying, Jesus is the word of God who was with God in the beginning. Jesus is God. And therefore, the rest of John's gospel is intent on making that fundamental truth clear. So this morning, we turn to the scene in which Jesus was visited by a man who was seeking answers. His name was Nicodemus, and he was a Jewish leader who would have had an intimate knowledge already of the drama of Scripture. Nicodemus would have absolutely known that God created the world, he created all of humanity, that humanity had sinned against him, that, cre- that we had fallen, and he would also have known that God had started this redemption plan. But what Nicodemus is trying to find out from Jesus is, hey, Jesus, what's your role in all of this? I don't, I'm not quite sure yet. So open up a Bible or an app to John 3 as we enter into the drama of Scripture together. If you're using a pew Bible, then it's on page 887. And as you turn there, I'll pray for us. Lord Jesus, would you speak to us like only you can? Would you tune our ears to hear you ever so clearly? Would you tune our hearts to experience the fullness of all that you have for us? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you. Be magnified and glorified in this place. Amen. Amen. Beginning John 3, verse 1. But there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Okay, let's pause here for a moment. I want you to notice something about Nicodemus. He comes to Jesus with an open mind, okay? Now, albeit he does come under the cover of darkness because he might be a little bit embarrassed and he doesn't want his uh, friends to find out he's going to see Jesus, but nonetheless... He comes to Jesus with his questions. Now, remember, Nicodemus is a man with influence, with power, with authority, with money, and yet he's humble enough to come to Jesus and say, I don't know everything. Can you tell me some more stuff? And that is the way we need to approach God's word as we open it this morning. So we look at verse 3, and Jesus is telling Nicodemus that a person needs to be born again. And you probably know that that's where uh, the phrase born-again Christian comes from. 
But Nicodemus is wondering, uh, because he's never heard this before, and he's like, uh, how, how does that work? How, how do we go back into our mother's womb for a second time? And Jesus is like, no, you're missing the point, because that Greek word actually means born from above. And so Jesus is telling Nicodemus that you need to be born from above. And so he's still not quite getting it, so Jesus continues, and he tells Nicodemus that a person needs to be born of water and the Spirit in order to enter the kingdom of God. And while this might seem kind of cryptic to us, like we're still not getting it either, this was probably a little bit more familiar to Nicodemus considering he was a Pharisee. The prophet Ezekiel described an interplay between water and flesh and the spirit several central centuries earlier. In Ezekiel 36, it says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you. This sounds a lot like a spiritual rebirth. But even if Nicodemus had figured out this correlation, he's still admittedly confused, and so we had to keep going. Look at verse 10. Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Stop here, because we need to dig into this, because This is what this series is all about. We are seeing how Jesus fits into all of Scripture. And thankfully, on this occasion, Jesus clearly tells us how he fits into all of Scripture. So you can flip back to uh, Numbers 21 that April read for us on page 129 if you want. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time here to explain this. God's chosen people have fallen back into a really common cycle of uh, just bad behavior. And right before this passage, God has given them a great victory over their enemy, the Canaanites. And right after God has shown up, right after God has given provision and shown his power to them, they partake in one of their favorite pastimes, complaining. Yeah. And it's not just complaining they're actually making accusations against the character of God. And God is loving, and he's kind, and he's gentle, and he's patient, but he's also just, and he's also righteously angry. So on this particular occasion, he sent a punishment in order to discipline his children. And it is a terrifying scene as Snakes enter the Israelite encampment and just start biting people and killing them. And the venom of the snakes is actually showing us that it's a, it's a literal representation of the sins of the people. Because the venom killed their bodies like our sins kill our souls. When we read this, we have to be careful not to blame God or to question his goodness. And the reason I say that is because if you read this text, the very people who are experiencing this do not blame God or question his goodness. Instead, they repent. They say, I'm sorry. They beg for God to intervene. And so God, being merciful, provides a remedy. He tells Moses to make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a broad serpent, set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Now look at that side by side with what Jesus says in John 3. 
And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. In this moment, Jesus is not equating himself with Moses. That's not the parallel. The parallel that Jesus is telling Nicodemus is that he is actually the bronze serpent. He's telling Nicodemus that he will die and that his death will unlock eternal life. And the Greek word here for lift up, to lift up, is hupso'o. And all five times that John uses it, it, he's using it to describe the crucifixion. But that word, hupso'o, actually means to exalt. So as humans literally lift up Jesus to his death, God is exalting him. What humans intended for bad, God uses for good. That's what happened on the cross. God's enemy thought they were achieving some sort of great victory, but God was actually being exalted. And his redemption plan in that moment was actually being executed. And in light of the crucifixion of Christ, we can understand more fully this famous verse from John. As we continue reading in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son in the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So let's look at these questions we're trying to answer. The first two, why did Jesus have to come and why did Jesus have to die? He didn't have to come. He didn't have to die. That's the first thing we need to remember. He did it as an act of selfless love out of his own free will. He did it because he wanted to restore his relationship with his children. He made a way when there was no way. This is how Charles Spurgeon puts it. You stand before God as if you were Christ, because Christ stood before God as if he were you. God sent his only son in order to be the way. He lived a sinless life as the new, as the perfect, the complete, and the last Adam. But he had to die because it wasn't enough for Jesus just to be an example for us. There was still a debt that needed to be paid. God's all loving, but as we saw with the snakes, he is just. And the penalty for sin is death. And that judgment was pronounced on humanity after the rebellion with Adam and Eve. And that's why Jesus had to die. In theological terms, it's called penal substitutionary atonement. And the best way that I can describe that is through a story, an illustration. Imagine there is a righteous judge seated at his bench. And before him, his one and only son is on trial. And he obviously loves his son. But as he's listening, and the whole courtroom is listening to the evidence that's produced, it becomes clear to everyone that his son is guilty of this crime. The dad loves him, but he's also not corrupt. He's a just judge. And the dad also knows that his son knew that what he was doing was wrong and that there were penalties for his actions. So being a good judge, the father slams the gavel down and he says, guilty. And you have to pay $5,000. $5,000. And the son's shocked because the son thinks, I thought, I thought my dad loved me. I thought he loved me. He knows I can't pay $5,000 and I'm going to have to go to jail instead. And while the son's sitting there dwelling in his misery, his dad stands up, takes off his robe, joins him on the other side of the bench, takes out his checkbook, and write a check for $5,000. All the son has to do is take the check. Now, I know some of you in here are like, oh, $5,000, I'd definitely stroke that check. 
But that's not the point. <laughs> the point is that we have a penalty. There is a price to be paid. In God's economy, this is a price that we cannot afford. And Jesus Christ is the only perfect one who is a sufficient payment. Jesus' death is our ransom. He purchased us on that cross. And Jesus is the only one who fixed the problem of sin that separates us from God. Now, of course, Jesus' sacrificial death for us is meant to also be an example, and that's how we live into this story, that each day we lay down our lives and we pick up our cross and follow him. But as we move on to this next question, which is, Jesus, why, what did Jesus' death and resurrection accomplish for us, which is very interrelated with the first two, I want us to consider the remarks that Christ made to Nicodemus, because I think that will help us answer this question. It's clear that Jesus' work on the cross made the new birth possible that he and Nicodemus were talking about. The kingdom of God has come. Our redemption has been accomplished. Our reconciliation to God and to one another has been realized. Death has been defeated. Christ is the victor, and evil has been vanquished. Praise Jesus. Like he said on the cross, it is finished. Jesus' resurrection and his death give us access to God and restore our present lives while also guaranteeing our future lives. Ultimately, the cross of Christ is the anti-venom for our sinful state. But wait, Jesus on the cross said it's finished. I don't know about you all, but it doesn't seem finished to me. If it was finished, why was that Mormon family massacred last week? If it's finished, why is there absolutely enough resources and food to go around the world and people are still dying of starvation? If it's finished, why is my marriage falling apart? Well, mine's not. I'm just using it as an example. <laughs> A marriage falling apart. People are suffering if it's finished. If it's finished, why, after battling cancer for 12 years, did my mom die the way that she did a month ago, where the last two weeks were absolutely horrific? The amount of pain that she was in and the amount of just turmoil that was in my household as my sister and dad cared for her. Like, it doesn't seem finished. And so as I performed the funeral, I recognized that we are living in this tension, this reality that the kingdom of God is here, but it's not yet complete. So in light of the crucified and risen Lord, this is what I proclaimed through tears at my mother's funeral. We are given taste in this life, moments of, or glimpses where we realize this is not all there is, that there is more. We are gathered today knowing and trusting that this is not the end for Deirdre. That for Deirdre, she is in a place where there is no mourning or pain, there is no cancer, any and all ailments she had are now gone. And she's there not because she did the right things, not because she was so kind, intelligent, generous, caring, compassionate, and friendly, all of which she most certainly won, was. She's not there because she was an amazing mother and grandmother. She's there because of her faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I asked her in her final weeks whether she believed that Jesus was the Son of God who lived a perfect life and died on the cross for her sins, and she said yes. I asked her if she believed that Jesus was raised from the dead, and she said yes. And she still had doubts, and she still had fears, but she was willing to place her faith in Christ, and that is what it's really all about. It's not about earning God's love and favor. It's not about accomplishing enough, going to church enough, praying enough. It is about Jesus Christ being enough. God wants us with him for all eternity, and so he saved us and he made a way for us. It is our relationship with Jesus that opens up heaven's gates to us, not because our lives are perfect or we are better than others, but because God has rescued us 
And once you are his, he never lets you go. From this world to the next, we are his. I believe that promise because as we look back on the drama of Scripture, every single promise that God has made, he has fulfilled. He has never failed us, and he will never fail us. And so Jesus' death and resurrection inaugurated, it began the kingdom of God on earth, and it did finish the saving act. But this ongoing renewal project, as we notice the world's not the way it's supposed to be, that project that Jesus is embarking upon will keep going until he returns. In fact, we've got Acts 5 and 6 in the coming weeks to, to talk about some of this stuff. Now, I believe Nicodemus, when he comes to Jesus, he does what we do. What Nicodemus is really asking Jesus, I feel like, is he wants a practical kind of take-home thing from Jesus. He wants to know how. How is this all going to work? And so every good sermon is supposed to have some sort of take-home point, right? Like a practical, do this and you'll be okay. Here's the practical take-home point. Look to the cross of Christ. Every single day, all day, look to the cross of Christ. That is the central part of this story. All you have to do, if you haven't already, is look to the cross of Christ. Receive what is given to you freely. We have to be reminded of it all day, every day. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for making a way when there was no way. God, we thank you that you have called us to be a part of your story. We thank you that you did what we could not do. We thank you that you didn't have to do what you did, but you did it anyway. And so, Father, if there is anyone in this sanctuary this morning who is not convinced of the fact that you did this for him or her, would your spirit convince them right now that however far separated they feel like they are from you, that all they have to do is look to your cross? You finish the work, and we reap the benefits. God, be with us as we try to just live into the reality of all that you have done for us. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. So we're going to segue into uh, worship through offering. And we sang this song a couple weeks ago, and I asked Abby if we could sing it again. It's called How Great a King. And there's this line in there that I think is just a beautiful thing for us to sing out. And oh, what a price you paid. Trading the highest place, you laid down your crown for me. How great a king. How great a king.